Hello again, everybody. It's Scott Casper, Takedown Wrestling. Today, we have the pleasure of catching up with a good buddy of mine, Lee Kemp. He goes into the Nike hot seat today. Lee, how are you? I'm doing great, Scott. By the way, you sound terrific, and I'm going to let our viewers know that we're going to have some technical issues periodically through the interview, most of it having to do with your computer camera is uh, having some uh, issues, but uh, just a little bit of a, bit of a brief review, uh, a world champion, uh, a couple times at 74 kilos, uh, three times actually, uh, Pan American Games champ in 87 and 83 before that in Caracas, uh, winning the World Cup uh, four times. I mean, you've just been that guy, denied the opportunity to compete for the Olympics in 1980 along with the rest of your team. But today you join us for a little catch up on what's going on in Lee Kemp's life. How have you been? Things are great, Scott. Um, you know, I... Uh... You know, I'm having the experience finally of coaching or at least having a son that's wrestling. So I'm a, I'm a wrestling dad. Your wrestling dad, he's what, 16? Uh, he's, oh, he'll be 16 in a few days, actually. Wow. Uh, he's a sophomore in high school. Seems so. like all your kids have a birthday within about a week of each other. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, March uh, 7th, March 3rd, and March 4th. Wow. <laughs> Man, I mean, at least you only go to the store once, right, to, to get the <laughs> Absolutely. <guests. laughs> you were... Uh, brought up in a sport that obviously embraced you you embraced it right now we are preparing for uh the pan-american games in frisco texas and beyond that uh the olympic uh, team uh, trials and then of course uh, the world games the world cup i should say and then beyond that the olympic championships this is a special time of year can you relate to these guys even to this day? Can you relate to the gals and the guys that are that are preparing for competition and that special opportunity to represent Team USA? Absolutely, Scott. It's um, it's really hard to describe because you know the Olympics come around every four years, and uh, the World Championships. If you're international competitor, post college, or if you're in college or high school, you at least have another year. You know, you kind of. If things don't go right one year, you go, oh, I can do it maybe next year. Well, the Olympics is if you don't get it done now, you've got to wait four years. And I was kind of unfortunately in that situation in 1980. Four years is a long time. So these athletes that are preparing now for Rio, it's there is tremendous amounts of pressure and making sure every detail is correct from your technique, your tactics, your diet, nutrition, all of it. And then you got to perform in the Olympic trials, make the team. Then you have to perform on that one day, that one day you've got to be on in those matches. So uh, to become an Olympic champion is truly a remarkable uh, feat. Lee Kemp, our guest, uh, seven-time gold medalist. Uh, he's one of the only guys in the entire world that can honestly say that he beat Dan Gable, which... Uh, I remember our very first conversation, Lee, and I think we perhaps uh, focused on that a little bit much, but Mike Beacom did a great job in chronicling that very special day in that article that uh, he wrote in the Wisconsin uh, Sports, uh, Inside Wisconsin Sports, where, uh, you know, he really got inside you. He did a really wonderful job, I think, of helping to tell that story. Do people still talk to you about that day? Occasionally they do, but uh, you know the generation of people that remember that they're they're older. Obviously, they're around. You know, I'm 59 right now, and so these young wrestlers today they don't really uh, they have no knowledge of that. It's, it's really funny though. The younger wrestlers they've heard of Dan Gable, but you'd be surprised at the people that don't know who our current stars are, and that's that's uh, that's odd to me. You know. But that just shows you the power of Dan Gable's you know, name and reputation that uh, you can be in a clinic full of 200 wrestlers and a lot of them know who Dan Gable is. But not many will know who our current stars are. So it's kind of, uh, uh, it's kind of perplexing, but it just shows you the star power of Dan Gable still. Yeah, no doubt. And, and you and Dan obviously are friends. And yes. It was 40. It was 40 think about this. It was, uh, actually, it was 31 years ago that uh, you defeated him. You were 18 years old at the time. Yes, and he was 26. I was, um, uh, it was in November, so my birthday was uh, December 24th, so I, you know, I was going to turn 19 uh, in, uh, in less than about a month. But yeah. Is it more important today to be super quick, uh, super talented with a bag full of tricks, or is it a combination of everything? Because wrestling has changed internationally. 
and jumping from a three-time NCAA champ into the world stage seems to me to be more difficult today perhaps than it was then. Is that true or is that just my observation? No, I, I think it's this. I think it's similar. You know, when I look back on our uh, champions during my era, they were older veterans, you know, and I think they, like, for instance, Stan Desick paved the way for me. You know, he won the world championships in 1977, uh, coming off of a bronze medal in the Olympics in 76. But he was older. He was toward the end of his career. And I think uh, just the way our system was set up then, um, or the system, the way it was set up in, in the rest of the world, there just wasn't a lot of international events. So our high school or our college athletes had to take that process to learn the freestyle uh, style. And that would take three or four or five years. So I think that's very similar to today. You know, even, um, you know, Jordan is an exception for sure. But uh, outside of him uh, and uh, Kyle Snyder, of course, um, then you have Aaron Pico. But those guys have come along because they made a concerted effort in high school to focus on the international style, like going to the Olympic Training Center, foregoing a year of high school, uh, as in, or, or, or foregoing a year of college, going to the training center, in the case of Aaron Pico, not going to college at all, just focusing on international. But those are just individuals. But in terms of the masses, I think it's similar. You know, in, in order to get on that level to compete internationally, it, it takes three or four years of battling internationally you know, to finally get to that place where you can start to get on the award stand to, to be a medalist. Not only that, then you have to, once you battle internationally, then you have to come home and battle those that you've been training with to compete uh, for that spot to be able to represent the United States. And it's uh, it's this ongoing, constant competition cycle that you guys go through. And it's phenomenal. We talk a little bit about name recognition at Gable. Well, Lee Kemp has his own... Uh, you know, level of recognition and fame and fortune that goes with it. And recently, I was a little bit nonplussed to read that uh, uh, the management of the International Fraternity of Wrestlers had released a statement that that perhaps you had not that you had not made insinuating things that you had not uh, said or or done. And I want to I want to address that in our interview today. I don't want to focus solely on this, but. Perhaps this will give you an opportunity to clear the air as well. But let's talk a bit about this because I got an email from um, the IFW saying that you were no longer associated with it. Let's go before that. Uh, they they said that uh, you were uh, going to be taking over the IFW, the International Fraternity of Wrestlers. Uh, should I say wrestling? Uh, no, it is wrestlers. The International well, Fraternity of Wrestlers. Pardon me for getting it wrong. Uh, the idea was that um, you, uh, in, I believe it's in quotations said that you would, uh, uh, be leaving having been coerced or, uh, per perhaps I even say threatened by USA wrestling's James Ravenack, uh, USA wrestling itself and others. Is that true? Scott, that is so far from the truth. It's incredulous. Really. I, I can't believe the, the level of, uh, and I'll just use the word ruthlessness really by Chuck Harmon. I, I, you know, he's a guy that's passionate about wrestling. I think his intentions and in starting the IFW, he is the founder of it. I think we're good. I think he want, he wanted to help wrestling, but, uh, his way that he goes about it is so, uh, offensive to almost anyone he comes in contact with that, uh, that he really is just, no one wants to work with him. And uh, he approached me about taking over the IFW for that very reason, that he was aware that his persona, his personality, the way he conducts himself is so offensive to people that he knew that the IFW wouldn't have a chance of succeeding if he was running it. But many believe that, you know, some of the ideals and things that the IFW was trying to pursue was good. So he asked me if I would take it over. And one of the things I said to him was, Chuck, you know, you and I both know that you no one will work with you, basically, you know, and he agreed. And uh, he's and, and he said, Lee, but they'll work with you. And I said, well, maybe I don't know. And so I just wanted to test the waters a little bit. So I actually called some uh, people within USA Wrestling and the U.S. Wrestling Foundation, and they all 
uh, because of my reputation and who I was, I said, Lee, we, we would probably work with you if it was just you. And, uh, and so Chuck agreed that he would step completely away from the IFW and that I would run it. So I agreed to do that. And that was all conversation, though. There was no formal agreement done, no contract of any kind. I haven't been paid uh, one dime to do any of this. But there were some uh, emails and blog posts uh, by Chuck and the IFW saying that I was going to take it over. And uh, maybe a bit premature, but I was okay with that because of the prior conversations Chuck and I had about taking it over. And as we got further and further into it, I realized Chuck was not going away. And he was continuing to press his agenda and his issues. And really, I, I realized he was using me, really, mm-hmm. uh, because of my reputation and good name in wrestling. He was using me as a front so that he could continue behind the scenes pressing his agenda. And so when I finally realized that, I, I wanted out. I wanted no parts of it. And yeah. so. Let's, let's just kind of raise. Um, re- perhaps uh, tell people what their agenda is. The IFW is a for-profit organization made up of members, and their intention is to grow that membership. Paid members, uh, people who want to be a part of the IFW, receive discounts at retail stores, and uh, it's it's a card-carrying membership-based organization. The the IFW's goal, if I understand their goal, is that they would be um, a part of the future of the sport of wrestling, helping to institute change uh, as they saw fit, uh, you know, railing against bad things and promoting good ideas and, and uh, things that could help the sport. But all the, all the way along the way, it's, it's almost as if they've been uh, doing the wrong thing. Uh, I didn't even want to say the wrong thing, but unintentionally or intentionally uh, misleading and misdirecting. Is that true? You know, from what I could see is that there was uh, an agenda by Chuck to expose weaknesses or inefficiencies or things that he thought the organization and other organizations could be doing better. And it was relentless. It was relentless to the point where it was counter effective to where Mm -hmm. people just didn't want him around because he was constantly being negative. And uh, I wanted no part of that. I told him, uh, on many occasions that I would did not want to be involved in that fight that, that he had, that he wanted to continue to do with us, USA wrestling. So, uh, I wanted out. I didn't okay. want any part of that. And that that's, so I made a statement to clear up any confusion about anyone who had seen former blog posts or comments by Chuck that I was taking over the, the IFW. I wanted to finally make a statement to say that I was not involved and I was, I was removing myself from that organization. So, uh, I, I presented Chuck a statement. I wanted him to circulate it. And he did, but he, he framed it around statement that he made saying that I was coerced to do that. And I just, like, could not believe that he did that. Were was, you coerced in any way, shape, or form by USA Wrestling, Jim, Jim Ravenack, or anybody with the U.S. Wrestling Foundation? Absolutely not. It couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, you know, they're friends of mine, not that that matters or or not, but they are friends. I've been in, been involved in USA wrestling for a long time. I mean, I was, I was one of their first uh, athletes that had uh, continued success in the international realm and enjoyed many, many years of success in partnership working with uh, USA wrestling. You know, heck, I was the Olympic coach in in 2008. Uh, There was none of that. There was, there was no negative uh, associations during any of that time period. And, um, for Chuck to frame my statements like that okay. without my knowledge, uh, without my approval. And, uh, he left me off the distribution list, but he did that solely to push his agenda, to expose what he believes to be some negative, uh, um, shortcomings of USA wrestling and, and it's a bit in its inability to get corporate sponsorship, to get media attention, all those kind of things, which is what the tenets were of the IFW was. So, and, and, and I want to ask you this, do you believe he re- misrepresented you, your intentions, your position with the IFW to, to forward, uh, uh, the IFW's case? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And he used me to do that. He used me. And I, I'm hurt and disappointed that he had a total disregard for me and my reputation and all the hard work I've done and, and uh, relationships I've built over the years that he would just so very uh, uh, selfishly and meaninglessly uh, push all that aside just to get one more jab in Okay. Uh, by him stating that uh, 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 USA Wrestling and the FW were trying to hurt his organization and him. Lee Kemp is our guest, and to put closure to this portion of our interview, Lee, I will ask you three questions. And the first question is this. Uh, did you have any involvement with the IFW? Yes, I did. I, I, I shot a commercial for them, and a lot of members may have, a lot of people from your audience may have seen that commercial on their website. Um, I asked Chuck to take it down once we got to that point where I realized I didn't want to be involved. And uh, we were we had discussions of me running the organization, but only if he removed himself. So, but um, obviously that, that didn't but, happen. That didn't happen, and we never even got I don't think anywhere close to that because uh, there was never a budget established. There was money that needed to be raised in order to fund you know me being there. That never happened. So really, it was in my mind, it was just only conversation. There was nothing formal that that was in place nothing in writing that was in place there was no money that was in place okay. in fact uh there was just there was just a lot of ex there was a lot of more things that needed to happen before this ever could come into fruition with me actually running that organization all right and 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 i will ask again just so we're clear on this did anybody at usa wrestling or the u.s wrestling foundation coerce you threaten you or insinuate that if you did not disassociate yourself with the IFW, you would be persona non grata? Were you threatened in any way, shape, or form? Absolutely not. I was not coerced, threatened, pressured. Uh, in fact, um, Rich Bender, uh, the executive director of USA Wrestling, said that, Lee, I'll work with you. you know. And he said, that, but it has to be under the conditions that it's just you. Because you know they had had prior dealings with, with Chuck Harmon. And, uh, I don't want to get into that, but, but they, they were willing to work with me because they could see some benefits of trying to create an organization that could, uh, uh, widen the membership base and trying to create more media attention. You know, there's a lot of things that, that, that were really pretty positive about trying to have a focused effort like okay. that. So in the end, do you now have any relationship with membership in or, and that's a, that's a key point, are you still considered a member of the IFW or have you disavowed any relationship with them at all? I've disavowed all uh, relationship with them and my, my membership was one that they, uh, they granted me as kind of a uh, condition of, a condition of, so I've never paid them any money to become a member. They, they granted that to me. Uh, at the very beginning when they were uh, uh, asking me to be involved. Okay, and so again, Lee Kemp is, is <clears throat> acknowledging publicly that he doesn't have a relationship with the IFW or Chuck Harmon or any of the representatives of the IFW and was in no way, shape, or form coerced or threatened by members of USA Wrestling staff or governing body or the U.S. Wrestling Foundation. So we're clear on that, and I hope people uh, will accept that for what it is and move on from here. Let's move on, Lee, if we can, uh, to what the next step is for America's athletes. And I, I pardon, please, Lee, I'm sorry to have dragged that out. Uh, I just wanted to be clear on the points, the salient points, uh, for obvious reasons, but I want people to be understanding of the facts as well. Uh, if we can uh, move on to these, uh, for some can be perilous steps uh, for competition, um, and, and I think Gable called it, at least in the NCAA wrestling or Division One wrestling, uh, where you are peaking. How do you plan on peaking for uh, the several different steps of competition in an attempt to make an Olympic team? Is that something you sit down with your coaches, nutritionists? I mean, there's, there's probably several people involved more than just you now, right? Absolutely. You know, back in my era of wrestling, it was it was only the athlete. But now you do have people in all those various components. In fact, I mean, when you even not being critical of this, but back in my era, I, I didn't have a personal coach. It was just me, you know, and uh, I had a club that funded my way to get to the tournaments and stuff. But, um, you know, it just wasn't it just wasn't the way it is now. But the way it is now, you do have 
not just one coach, you have several coaches that are all have a vested interest in you getting to where you need to go. I know some of our top athletes, they'll have a nutritionist. Um, they'll have a coach in certain areas within uh, their club that have certain expertise that they tap into. There's um, So, yes, there, it's a concerted effort to make sure that the athlete is able to not just peak once, but they're going to have to just have multiple peaks because, as you pointed out, you've got to make the team first. And the, making the team is a series of competitions. And then after you make the team, then you've got to be prepared to win on that particular day. And, and let, let's talk about coaches, for example. Let's, let's, let's say uh, you are training at the Wisconsin Regional Training Center, okay? And then you have to train at the, uh, at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs. I'm not even sure in, in what, what, uh, how you put those things together in, in terms of coaches and who you're responsible to and how you're responsible. But obviously there's a, there's a juggling of what competitions you go to your training schedule and how you peak. We talk a little bit about peaking, but um, is it, it, it from a, from an outsider looking in from the media looking in, uh, it seems to me we're spreading our athletes kind of thin. What are your thoughts in that area? You know, again, it's, you know, my era was very different. You know, my era in order to get access to the best coaches, you went to the training center you know, that's where I would have access to Gable and that Stan Desick, you know, the two coaches in my era that were uh, the ones that, you know, Stan was a national coach. Dan was the coach of the actual teams that I was on. But now you've got this regional concept where all these various athletes are training within their individual localities, whether it's Pennsylvania, whether it's uh, at Ohio State University, whether it's at Iowa and Wisconsin and so forth, and even out in California. So it is kind of spread out. So there is no centralized way to train our athletes to make sure they're, they're getting all the skills that, that they need uh, to be able to go to the next level. I know the training center, they bring athletes in for, you know, for periods of time to try to do that. But then the athletes go back out to their training uh, facilities. And uh, I'm not sure about how the continuity would work in terms of what they would learn at the training center and then how that is reinforced when they go back out to the regional training centers and where they do like 90% of their training, really. I mean, they do training there and then they go to the trials to make the team and then they go out to the training center just for short amounts of time. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a tough thing to put all that together because uh, uh, things have evolved you know, and these athletes do have more opportunities to get more specific types of training and nutrition and all those other things that we've talked about. Lee, it's always good to talk to you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in several locations. One, of course, will be the Olympic trials in Iowa City, Iowa in April. Uh, it'll be good to see you there, and of course, uh, on in June as well for the World Cup in Los Angeles at the Forum. It's always uh, tremendous, the opportunity I get to spend time with you. And today is no different, my friends. Always good to see you. Best to uh, your family as they get ready to celebrate their birthdays, all three of them, respectively. And uh, we're looking forward to it. By the way, hats off to you again. I think you were the fifth American sure. to be inducted into the UWW Hall of Fame, right? Uh, yes. You know, United World Wrestling. Quite an honor. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate that. What a what a what an honor indeed, and deservedly so. And I think um, I think Wade Shallis is taking quite a bit of credit for your career. Would you say that's a? a f <laughs> I understand maybe Stan Desick, but Wade Shallis, I don't know. <laughs> uh -oh. He's a good fella. He's a good fella. Funny and funny indeed. Lee, thank you so much for the many years uh, that you've been leading. I look forward to many more years of your leadership. A uh, great example for our youth out there, and uh, Wisconsin obviously is a huge beneficiary of your uh, your talents over the years. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. For all of us at Takedown, a very special one-on-one -on -one today with Lee Kemp. He's been sitting in our Nike hot seat, <laughs> and uh, the day that Kemp beat Gable, yeah, Lee Kemp beat Dan Gable. It was uh, eight. Well, he was eighteen years old then, and we're a couple years advanced from there. But uh, go back and look at that footage. It's some phenomenal footage. We appreciate you watching this very special edition one-on-one -on -one with Lee Kemp. Catching up, I'm Scott Casper. Thanks for watching.